So we started section 2.2 last time. We're describing sets. And we're going to continue in this vein. Um, we are at the point where we got to Venn diagrams. Does that sound right? Wonderful. All right, so Venn diagrams are diagrams that are used to illustrate ideas in logic. A couple of components of Venn diagrams, and I'll draw a picture in a minute, is the universal set, which is the set that contains all elements being considered in a given discussion, and the complement of the set, which is all the elements in the universal set that are not in set F. And our book uses this notation for complement. It puts a bar on the top of F. For those of you who've had contemporary math, that book uses this notation for complements. And there's actually a third notation that's sometimes used in resources, which puts a little C in the corner, kind of like an exponent location. <clears throat> All mean the same thing. It's just complements. Is that one you want us to use? I don't really care, but the one that you're probably going to use, just by default, is the complement that I've written in here, just because that's what our book does. You'll see it most frequently. But if you want to use a different one, I don't care. Okay, so picture-wise, um, Venn diagram looks like this. I'll draw a little bitty one down here in the bottom left-hand corner. So you've got a rectangle. That's the universal set, so we'll label it U. And then any set inside of it, they're calling this set F, is drawn as a circle. Everything inside the circle would be F. And then everything out here, which I'll shade in orange, would be considered F complement. So I don't want to write it inside of there because I already wrote my U inside of there, but the F complement is the orange part here. So for example, um, if we let the universal set be people that live in my house, okay? And since I'm using an F here, I'm gonna put F be the females. All right, so the females are inside the circle then the orange on the outside would be the males that live in my house. Um, or in some cases, when it's not a, an either or, you can just say they're not whatever the description is on the inside. So for example, if F had been freshman and you had been the university, doing really good with letters today, aren't I? F is freshman and the U in the university, then the orange would be not freshman, which would include sophomores, juniors, and seniors, right? Try to think if there's anything else. I guess you could get graduate students at OBU because we do have graduate students too. Okay, so F and, and then F complement. <coughs> okay, so here's our example with our U um, being the university. So U is the set of all students at OBU. A, the set of those who are graduating. We're going to describe the complement of A. So if this is A complement, right, that's the notation. What would the complement of be of all the students who are graduating? All the students who aren't. And we will specify that we're still talking about OBU students. So OBU students. Who are not graduating. Is it the same as like the statements and stuff where you need a word the same or can you just? Um, not necessarily. I think you're thinking about like when we did the negation statements and stuff. Um, it, it has a similar feel to it, but it doesn't have to be worded quite so specifically. Like you're not going to see quantifiers with these, like the sums and the nuns and the alls. None of that's going to show up in this. So the process is a little bit more straightforward. Okay. Moving forward then, we have what are called subsets. So a subset is just a set inside of a set. So think embedded circle. I'll draw that picture in a minute. The description says the following, for all sets A and B, B is a subset of A if and only if every element of B is an element of A. And it is written like this. So this kind of looks like a, a U on its side or like a really squished C with a line underneath it. Um, we will often use the phrase contained in when we say it. So if we're reading it sort of from left to right, you're likely to hear me say that B is contained in A. Um, it yields to that visual description of these embedded circles that I haven't yet drawn, but we will. Now, the equals on the bottom means they could be equal. So if you think about why that makes sense, let's say, again, I use the universal set as everybody in my household. Okay, my husband is 40, 
Um, six, I think that's right. Let's go with 46, pretty sure he's 46. So if the universal set is everyone in the household, and then we start doing these subsets down from there, and I do the bigger circle on the outside is going to be, um, I was gonna do age stuff. Um, so all, let's do it that way, I can do it that way. Let's do the bigger circle on the outside is all the adults, okay? And then I have a circle on the inside that says the adults that are under 50. Those would just be the descriptions of the same thing in that situation. So they would be the exact same set. But by definition, it would work. Everybody in the adults under 50 category would be also in the adults category, right? So that's just a further describing kind of characteristic. But the easiest way to remember it is that the equals under mean, under nine, underneath could mean that they're actually equal sets. Much like if we write something like this compared to this. Right, the equals underneath doesn't mean it has to be equal to seven, but it could be, and it'd be okay. Whereas the first description, it couldn't actually be equal to seven and be okay. So if we remove that line underneath, we have the second description on this slide, proper subset. So a proper subset, so for all subsets A and B, B is a proper subset of A. If and only if B is a subset of A, and there is at least one element of A that is not in B. So it looks like this. We just, whoops, we just remove the line from underneath. And another way of saying this, this at least one element of A that's not in B, is that we can actually say that A is bigger. Or you could say likewise B is smaller. It actually has to be smaller or bigger for that description to work. So, I don't know why I went with age because now I'm stuck. Universal set all the people in my household, big circle, adults. And if I made my big circle be just adults, like I did before, before I said my little circle was adults under 50. If I did adults under 45, my husband's now in the bigger circle because he's over 45, but I'm still in the smaller circle because I'm under. So it's actually a proper subset because there's a smaller group inside than there was already before. So I keep saying I'm gonna draw the picture and I haven't done it, so let me do it up here. So the picture for these looks like embedded circles, like I mentioned. So here's my universal set U, and I have B contained in A, so it looks like that. So kind of like a tire swing or a donut, okay? So everything in B is in A, which makes sense because the circle B is inside the circle A. The part that's a little bit tricky to remember is that it could be that there's nothing in the outer ring if the two descriptions are actually really just the same set, right? But the picture would still hold, it would just be that there's nothing in the outer ring. Okay, number of subsets. <clears throat> this is the last one on our slide. The number of subsets, so if we have n elements in a set, then there are two to the n subsets, and then two to the n minus one, so one fewer proper subsets. And I hope that it makes sense to you why we have to subtract one. We're subtracting one because we're subtracting the one that's exactly the same already. So we're taking away that possibility. So again, let's imagine the universal set, all the people in my family, and we make some sets inside of it. Well, you could have a set that's adults, and you could have a set that's teenagers, and you could have a set that's children, like, you know, under the teenage age or whatever, right? So you, you could have sets that contain just the girls. You could have sets that contain just the boys. You could have sets of the people who are you know, going to get home by 10 o'clock and the people who are not going to get home by 10 o'clock. You know, you could have any kind of description and it would include some sort of subcategory, you know, some piece of the picture of the family. Some of the sets are going to have one people in it, right? That's the children. That would be an example. My daughter, who's, who's you know, just a single child, under the 13 range. Some are going to have everybody in it. If we did all the people under 50, it'd be everybody, right? So you've got all, you have all these different descriptions and you can create all these sets of different sizes. This is simply telling you how many different ones of them you could create. So in my family, there's six of us that are living in my home right now. So two to the six would be the number that are the subsets and two to the six minus one would be the proper subsets. Okay, so it's a counting argument. So we're going to do the faculty, math faculty, at OBU. There's four of us. Um, I've mentioned all their names before, but I'll remind you in case you don't know. Most of you know Dr. Marsh and myself, right? Um, 
Some of you may know Dr. Tucker or Dr. Drake. You may know either of them. But those are the four. There's four of us. So if we want to know the difference number, how many different subsets there are, we would do 2 to the 4th. And what is 2 to the 4th? 16. 16. So remember, this is not multiplication of 2 and 4. It's 2 times itself 4 times. So we have 16. And how many proper subsets would there be then? Yeah, one less or one fewer. So there'd be 15 proper subsets. Okay, now we're going to switch the description to what we know. In number six, we actually know how many subsets there are, excuse me, proper subsets specifically that there are, and we're trying to figure out how many elements there would have been. So the formula for proper subsets was 2 to the n minus 1 equals 63. Well, well 2 to the n minus 1 is there's some number of subsets, and 63 is what we're given here for proper subsets. So if this is 2 to the n minus 1, you can think about this from an algebra perspective and say, okie dokie, well, what that means is I need my 2 to the n to equal 64. Um, you could also think about it just from the context, right? If there's 64, 63 proper subsets, there's 64 subsets total. So my 2 to the n needs to equal 64. Now, our goal is not to solve this with algebra. It really isn't. Trial and error would be just fine. Um, so if you happen to just look at this and know it, that's great. If you don't, try a few numbers in as the exponent and see which one actually works. Does anybody know what the exponent needs to be for this to work? It needs to be 6. Okay? So 2 to the 6th is 64. Um, and in, we're not trying to trip you up. Nobody's going to give you something that doesn't work. They're always going to actually work with a whole number up there. Um, so if you're not working that way, then you've probably made a mistake somewhere along the way before you get there. Okay, any questions on that? All right, we're going to take a look at some symbols then. So let me remind you of a symbol we encountered last time, though, before we get there. Um, the symbol we encountered last time that we haven't yet um, revisited this time was, where is it? There it is, this symbol right here. So this symbol means it's an element of something, right? So it's also contained in it. I mean, like, that's true. But it's a single item. It's an element. Whereas our new symbol with this, this sort of C with the underlying piece of it means it's a subset, like it's a collection of objects thought of as a set and self. And so we're taking a look on number seven and number eight at the same description but with different directions. Okay? So if you look at seven and you look at eight, it looks almost exactly the same. But seven wants us to use either element or not an element. So there's two things that you have to make sure of when you describe an element or not an element. The first thing is you need to make sure it's an element to begin with. For example, I'm kind of jump into the fun. C on the left-hand side is not an element. Why? It has the curly braces around it. Curly braces indicate that you have a set. Okay, does everybody see that okay? So it doesn't matter what comes after this on the right-hand um, right side. It doesn't matter in the slightest. This symbol on the left-hand side means I have a set. And a set is not an element. So it fails, but it doesn't fail because of sort of like what comes next. It fails because of its own structure. Do you see any other ones, A, B, or D, that are sets instead of elements? There's no curly braces, but do you see something that's a set? A. Yeah, I was like, I was thinking it was on B, but yeah, it's A. What is that thing on the left-hand side called? We saw it last time. It means there's nothing in it. It had two names. Do you remember what it were? Null set is one of them, and the empty set is the other. So those are two names for it. Um, but Ethan's exactly right. It's a set that contains nothing the null set or the empty set. So the second um, place where this is not going to work for sure is on A, because again, it's not a set. So these two fail because they are sets, not elements. 
And if they're not an element to begin with, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, is that all right? Okay, so those fail for that reason. Now, B and D, those are elements. 15 and 16, you know how many curly braces around them? They are elements. What the question is that you ask second then is are they elements of what's described on the other side? Okay, so let's look at B. Any idea what this notation is saying? Okay, very good. That's a very good description. So n is a natural number. Let's start there. What are our natural numbers? The counting numbers. One, two, three, four, and so on. Those are our counting numbers. So these are the types of numbers we're starting with. And then the, the equation in front of it says that we need to take each of those n's and multiply them by 2. So if I take each of those n's and I multiply them by 2, what will I get? It's not rocket science. You guys can do this. I know it. Thank you. 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. You guys just don't want to talk to me. I can tell. That's all right. 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. Otherwise known as the... Even numbers, yes, the even numbers. They're the even numbers. So the description on the right-hand side is that these are even numbers. And what does that tell you about 15? It's not, it's not an even number, so it's not going to work. So it's failing, but it's failing because it's not even, right? And everything on the right-hand side was descriptions of even numbers. Okay, what about D? 16 is an element. Is it an element of what's being described on the right-hand side? Yeah, this is a more straightforward picture of even numbers on the right-hand side, isn't it? It's the listing method. It's an incomplete list, I mean, right? But the dot, dot, dot tells us it, and it will continue on. So this one works. Okay, any questions on those? So it can fail in one of two ways. It can fail because it's not a, an element to begin with, or it can be an element, but it can fail to actually live inside of the category or the set that's on the other side. Okay, how do the directions change for number eight? Yeah, we're not talking about elements anymore. We're talking about sets. That said, Everything else in the setup on A through D is the same as the last problem, yeah? So the first thing you need to ask ourselves if we're asking, if we're looking at a subset is, are they sets to begin with? And not all of them are, right? A, B, C, D, which one are not sets on the left-hand side to begin with? B and D, the same ones that were elements before are still elements. So this one, and this one are going to fail, and they're going to fail because they are not sets. And if they're not a set, they cannot be a subset. So this is, whoops, yeah. They're not a subset notation. I guess I didn't actually define that for you, but I think that's okay. Right, draw a slash through something and it makes the word not go in there. Not equals, not a subset, not an element, not. Okay. Is that okay for those first? Okay, so now we're back to considering the two that we actually didn't have to consider last time. And there's, there are at least sets. Okay, so A is a set on the right hand, the left hand side. And C is a set on the left hand side. There are sets. Now, in order for them to be subsets, it means we have to ask ourselves the question about subsets. So that was over here. It's a subset if everything that's contained in what happens on the left, whatever those elements are, are also things that are contained, right, or elements of the items on the right. Everything that's on the left has to be inside of something that's on the right. We're actually going to look at four first, part C because it's the simplest of the two to sort of think through. 
there's only one thing inside the set on the left. It's the number four. Is the number four among the things that's described on the right? It is. Which one is it? It's the second one. It's the one plus three, right? So if you didn't like the way this was written down, you could actually change it and write down the corresponding elements that this is talking about, if that helps you to see it a little bit better. But this one right here is the item that is on the left-hand side. So it's not super exciting because there's not very many things in the set on the left to test, but we have tested all of them and all of them work, and so therefore this is a subset. Now, what's interesting to note right here is that it's also a proper subset, right? It's smaller. There's only one thing in the, left, the set on the left, and there's three, four elements, excuse me, in the set on the right. So while it didn't ask us, I'm going to note that we also could have used this symbol between them and it be an effective symbol here had the directions been stated differently. It is a proper subset as well. But generally speaking, it's a subset, so I can use the other notation and it doesn't hurt anything. Now, let's look at A. So we already said that the thing on the left-hand side is known as the empty set, the null set. It's a set with nothing in it. So think about the language and what's going on here. Is everything in the empty set also in the set on the right? The answer is yes. And it's one of those language things that feels weird to say. Because there's nothing in it anyway. In fact, everything in the set on the left of which there's nothing, is in the set on the right. It works, mm, kind of, it's kind of like it's, it's cheating. It feels like it's cheating. It's a subset. I'd like for you to make a note to yourself. The empty set is always a subset of every set. It always works. No matter what is on the right-hand side, the empty set is a subset of it. For the same reason I already described, which sounds funny, I know. But everything in it is in the other set. Okay. I think you'll like the next one. The next one's called the fundamental accounting principle. Anytime somebody tells you something's fundamental in mathematics, <coughs> it means it's important. Um, you've seen, though I'm not going to ask you to state it or anything, the fundamental principle of algebra. You saw it in an algebra course, whether it was actually presented to you in that language or not. You've seen it. It um, usually shows up in an Algebra 2 course. Um, there's a fundamental principle of calculus that shows up in my calculus course toward the end of Calc 1. So if any of you have had any calculus, which you may have, you've seen it there. So this one's the fundamental principle of counting. And it says the following. If an event M can occur in M ways, an event N can occur in N ways, then the event M followed by the event N can occur in M times N ways. So this right here is multiplication. And when we do an example, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay? So we have it written down, though. I'm close. So we're going to look at our outfits in our closet. That's what we're going to look at, for example. So if we go to our closet and we have three shirts, four skirts, you need four pairs of pants, I don't care, and five pairs of shoes. What the fundamental principle of counting says is that assuming everything would match or that we wouldn't care if it did, that we could find the total number of different outfits comprised of these three different items by multiplying the three shirts, the four skirts or pants, and then the five shoes. So operating with the fundamental principle of counsel counting is very straightforward. If you've had proportional and statistical reasoning, how many have had that class? Have any of you? Just Faith? Oh, and JC, because you guys are in my class. Um, this comes back up, or it comes up in that class as well. So you've, you two at least have seen it before. If you've had contemporary, which is Isabel and Faith, it's also shows up in there. So it's an overlapping kind of uh, theme for a lot of them. So what is 
3 times 5 times, I'm sorry, 3 times 4 times 5. It's 60. So there are 60 outfits. Okay, so we have one last example, example 10. So we're going to go shopping, um, you know, running errands, that kind of thing. And there are six stores that we could go to that we're trying to go to, but we only have time to go to three of them. I don't know if you have ever had this happen before where you're trying to go to lots of places and you have to pick something of this, you know, some smaller collection. Um, we're asking the question here then, how many different ways could we go to three of those six different shops? So in very much the same way that I wrote those sort of three space holders, I'm gonna write three space holders here because I'm going to three shops. Last time it was because I was picking one of three different categories of clothing items. Okay, so it's not always three lines. It just depends on what we're working with. And this is kind of like what we saw happen. In fact, oh, well, let me mention it because we actually did it. We wasn't like this last time. Remember when we did, th there it was, this problem? It was the one-to-one -one, um, one -one correspondences and I talked about the guys and the girls and pairing them off to go on a date or something like this. And we did six times five times four. This was an application of fundamental principle of counting. Okay, it's just that we paired everybody off. So in our situation right here, we have three stores we're going to, but we still have six to pick from. So first we've got to pick a store and there's six stores to choose from. So we have six options and we're not going back to a store again, right? Now, sometimes you do have an option where you're multiplying things that are the same number again and again, right? So like think about your ID number. Right? It doesn't, you can repeat numbers, right? In the ID number, like you can have, like I have multiple threes in my ID number. I have a couple threes. And so I can repeat the numbers. So it doesn't have to always decrease. But this scenario makes it that it will, right? The scenario does. So I have six different stores I could go to as my first stop. How many do I have for my second stop that I could go to? Five. And my third stop? Four. So six times five times four, 120. There are 120 different orderings of places and not just the places, but the order in which I go to them that I could make. Okay, there's 120 different ways, we'll say ways, that this could happen. And if I had time to go to all six of them, it would actually look exactly like that problem from last time, context different, right? But I would have six, five, four, three, two, and one, because I'm going to all my stores now. And if I multiply all of these together, what will I get? 720. So there's 720 ways that this could happen. Now, realistically, in most scenarios, there's some things that aren't likely to happen because maybe the stores are close together or far apart. You'd be going back and forth across town. There's, there might be lots of different things within the mall situation. Even you might be going back and forth across the entire mall. You wouldn't necessarily do them all, but there are 120 and then now 720 different ways that it could be done. Does that make sense? All right.